right, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is John Stoilov, uh, and I'm the Upper Midwest. I'm actually from Minneapolis. Uh, camera product educator for Canon. Been doing it for about nine years now with Canon. Before that, shot different companies. Our friends over at Company N, shot company Pentax for a while. Uh, different, you know, camera companies and stuff. I did shoot film for those of us who remember what film is. So it came in little <laughs> canisters, and we only got 24, or 25 shots sometimes, or 36 if you wanted to go, you know, extra. So. But you know, the, the advent of digital has really changed the industry quite a bit, obviously. One of the biggest advantages of digital is the fact that you can see the picture right away. And if you didn't get what you wanted, you can make some adjustments and you know, change some adjustments and shoot again. So it's the, the advent of having that screen in the back of the camera. You know, it doesn't matter if you bought the camera yesterday or you've been shooting sports for years. You know, all, you'll watch any type of photography and you'll see them you know, looking at their images to see if they got them or not. Today's class, we're going to cover speed lights. Um, or flashes. We're going to talk a little bit about everything with flash. So everything from the basic stuff, some of this might be a little bit of review for you. Uh, some of it will be a little bit more, it might be new to you. So we're going to kind of cover the whole thing, then we're going to actually do a demonstration and kind of show you how to set up um, our newest speed light, which is our new 600EX-RT speed light, which is our new flagship speed light. And we'll go through how to set that up, and that flash can be either a remote or a, a, basically a slave or a master uh, flash system. Uh, and we'll talk about how you can trigger it, how you can set up multiples, but we'll also talk about ETTL, uh, which is our normal flash options. So we will take time for questions. So you know, feel free. I, it's we'll, we'll hold questions towards the end of the class, just so that we can uh, get everybody's questions and answers uh, taken care of. So, all right. So let's cover some of the basics that we can do with speed lights. And you know, because flash photography is you know exactly what it is. You know, we're trying to add light to our scene when it's a really dark type of scene. So, and we have a whole bunch of different types of, you know, flashes. And I've always thought of the flash system as, you know, we have a pop-up flash, which is like a keychain flashlight. You know, it's good for about 10 to 15 feet. You know, it's not going to light up the whole stadium. Even though during, you know, a large sporting event, it looks really cool to see all the flash bulbs go off in the stadium. It's a really cool effect. But you're only lighting up about, you know, one or two rows in front of you. So, also, you know, so we'll talk about, you know, bigger flashlights, and we'll talk about what they can do and, you know, add more light to your scene. And if you want to just have one on the camera or off camera or remotely, you can fire off multiple flashes too. So, you know, flash recycle time, you know, the, one of the big advantages of having an extra speed light versus the pop-up flash is the fact that the, these flashes will run on their own power supply, which means they can recycle much, much quicker. Um, you can also speed up your recycling time, you know, if you're closer to your subjects or if you're going to be shooting, you know, at wider apertures. Um, use your high, using higher ISO settings, so different things that you can do to give you more faster flash recycle time. So, on the 5 series flashes, like our older 550s and 580s and six, even the new 600s now, if, if you need faster re flash recycle time, Canon does make a external battery pack, which we'll cover in a little bit too and talk about it. So when's your flash ready to go? We do have a pilot light um, on the back of the flash, um, and then it, you know, <laughs> comes on when, when the flashes are, are re ready to go at 100% re uh, fully recycled time. So for true full power, you know, wait a few seconds after the right ready light comes on and you'll get the, you know, okay flashlight. And that's, you know, we're at 100% full power. And then you can light up a, you know, your ETTL systems. When you're in a wireless system, we'll show you when you're, there's a, a setting too that'll tell you that those flashes are ready to go also. So you're not tripping flashes and you're like, why isn't that my, you know, off camera flash not tri tripping? One other thing with flash is also sync speed. How fast can you shoot? So most of the Rebels, actually all of them, the 5D, the 5D Mark II, the Mark III even, has the ability to shoot what we call a flash sync speed. So pop-up flash on the Rebels, or if you have just a flash on the camera, on a 5D camera or full frame that doesn't have a pop-up flash, the fastest shutter speed you can shoot is a 200th of a second at normal output. You know, so what flash sync speed is, is the fact that when you press the shutter button down and take a picture, you know, we have first and second curtains in the flash, and so your, your shutter will actually open, and one two hundredth of a second later, the second curtain follows up behind it, and that's your exposure. So you can shoot down at a hundredth of a second, eighth of a second, whatever you want, but the fastest you can pull the sh shutter speed up is a two hundredth of a second when you're under normal operations. If you have one of the, you know, the D cameras, I like to call them, uh, the 20, 30, 40, 50, D, 7, D, even the 1DX's cameras now, that's how you can shoot a little faster. So you can now go up to about a 250th of a second with either the pop-up flash 
or with one of the extra lights um, in normal operation. Your lens aperture also affects how much distance you're getting out of your flash. When you open your lens up, you'll actually get more distance out of your flash. Just like the human eye, you know, when you open your, you, you receive more light. So as you open your lens up, you'll actually affect the, the maximum distance of your flash also. Also ISO, how sensitive is your camera to light? You know, in the days of film, when we were buying, you know, film speed, or in the days, you know, if you want to date yourself and call it even ASA, the uh, higher the ISO, the more sensitive the camera is to light. So when you turn your ISO up, you'll get more distance. That's why with the pop-up flashes, I always say between 10 and 15 feet. You're around 10 feet at ISO 100, you turn it up to ISO 1600, you can get up to closer to about 15 feet. So, on the external flashes, on the ones that do have a monitor on the back of the screen, so the 430 and the current new 600 uh, does have a, a distance meter that can be read in feet or meters. Uh, the default is set to meters, but you can change that in the custom function if you want it say feet. So it'll take an effect uh, your lens aperture, it'll take an effect the um, the ISO that's set to the camera also, So and it'll just determine its output for you and kind of give you a range of what it will do for power. So flash distance ranges, you know, the closest you can really flash, you know, use these flashes is about three feet. Anything closer, you know, you will have, you know, it'll, you get some more of a kind of a spotlight on your subjects. The higher end flashes will have a diffuser that you can pull down and pop down, and that will break your um, angle of your light down to a 14 millimeter uh, lens. Make sure if you're not using it to fully press it all the way back till it clicks. Otherwise, then you have full range of the automatic zoom head that's in that flash. One note on Canon speed lights, or we, we call them speed lights or flashes, is that the the first two digits of the flash is the output of that flash at ISO 100 at exposure. So a 430EX2 flash has a guide number, for those of us who remember film again, um, of about 43 meters at ISO 100, which will translate to about 130 feet. Now if you turn your ISO up or open your lens up a little bit, you get a little bit more distance out of that flash. So those are how we kind of rate our flashes. So that's been going on for years. We have a 270 flash. So 27 meters. Um, we have 430, 580. Actually, there's a 320 flash in there also. So those are the, the distances. So 600 EXRT has a guide number of 60 meters at ISO 100. So that's how you can kind of determine. Because people always come up at trade shows or at the store and be like, well, how much light can I get out of this flash? So that's what you can have. And then, you know, it's like a headlight. So you know how much power you can have on down. So. One thing to remember too with flash is, you know, flash fall off. You know, they are just like your headlights. Your headlights do not illuminate the entire 30 mile road in front of you. You know, there is fall off to them. So it will only expose for a certain distance. And this is true with, you know, pop-up flash or any of the extra flashes fired directly onto your subject. So we have this flash fall off where the closest subject is bright and then it starts kind of going away. So just like normal headlights. And we'll show you some workarounds with that in a little bit. One thing that's also very important, you know, with flash is obviously your color. Um, you know, using the different types of white balance. So your cameras all have an automatic white balance that you can uh, have the camera set to and works out very, very well. And that's when we have the AWB setting and that will set up your, you know, system. If you're going to be using, you know, either no flash and you're going to be outside on a bright sunny day, so you can set your cameras to daylight and you'll get better color pictures. You can set your camera to the flash icon. Now the flash icon in our cameras is set to our color temperature of the flash bulbs. It's not set to a certain um, studio packs or third-party flashes. So if you set your, your Canon camera to flash white balance, it's, you're telling the, the system that you're using a Canon flash. If you're not using a Canon flash, if you're using you know, studio packs or some other type of light, you might notice a little bit of a color shift. So um, for the more advanced cameras, so the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 on up cameras, there is a Kelvin white balance option where you can physically dial in uh, a color temperature. If you shoot a RAW file, you can apply the Kelvin temperature to the file later through the Canon Digital Photo Professional software. So even if you have a Rebel and you want to use Kelvin white balance, you can shoot a RAW file and apply the, raw, the Kelvin temperature later. So one of the best ways to do is you know, custom white balance, especially when you're using mix, mixed color lighting situations, where you can you know, take a flash picture with a uh, gray target, um, some sort of calibration target, and then you can apply what you call a custom white balance. So. 
under different, you know, tricky lighting situations, obviously, like coming from different areas and stuff, I still like the automatic white balance. I think it does a really, really good job of balancing both on-camera flash and ambient light around the area, too. So, The 5 Series and the new 600 Series flashes have what we call an AF assist beam. So there will be a red light emitted from the flash, and that will send out to your subjects for, so in low light or high backlight situations, uh, it helps the camera autofocus assist. Uh, we do have the ability to, on the new flashes, like the 5 Series or the 600 Series, you can turn the head off. So that you won't actually have light come off of here. You'll just, you can just use the AF assist beam, and you'll see the red light come off your flash to help um, autofocus on to certain situations. We have the ability to, on our infrared transmitter, our STE2, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which is just a transmitter for the infrared system, that also does have an uh, uh, AF assist beam uh, emitter on it. So, so let's talk a little about ETTL. Um, ETTL is you know, electronic through the lens metering, and this is second generation now for Canon, and how the camera system looks at the reflectivity of light. So when you take a photograph, flash metering is done off of reflective light metering. So when you take a picture, even if you're just using the pop-up flash, and you take a photograph, a flash photograph, there's two bursts of light. The first light is what we call pre-flash. It will shoot out and then the camera knows what lens is on there, knows what flash is being used, and it'll figure out distances and how, you know, time the light as it comes back through the lens, and how much light comes back through the lens. And depending on that, how much light is coming back through the lens, the camera will make adjustments and say, okay, this is how much reflective light came back um, to me from the little pre-flash. Hey, flash, this is how much light I need you to send out. It tells the flash that, and the exposure is taken. It all happens within a fraction of a second. So you don't see the pre-flash ever. So when you take a flash picture, you just see one pulse of light, but there's actually two very, very quickly. So what happens is when you get that pulse of light coming through is that that reflectivity comes back and the camera looks at the metering system and says, okay, how, you know, what reflected back? Let's send out this mono, mono light to, you know, to light up our subject. Same thing in a situation there. No flash, you know, ambient light with no flash. Um, and then you can pop the flash up and again it will meter off you know, your subject, obviously, the subject's close to the camera, so it's going to meter off and come back towards you and look at it. So that's how the flash metering system uh, eventually, you know, works in the system for your system. Outdoors, you know, it's always nice to sometimes use our flash outside. One of the biggest things I see people, you know, here in New York and Times Square and, you know, Central Park is, you know, somebody asks, hey, can you take a picture of my family and I? Sure. Look at your camera. First thing I'll do, well, it's, there's some shadows on their face, and I'll make sure the flash is fired. You know, I'll force the flash on the camera. Instead of getting shadow pictures like this, we can get, you know, fill flash pictures. And of course, eventually somebody goes, oh, no, no, the flash went off. You ruined the photograph. And I'm like, no, I look at it. You know, it looks really good. And they're like, oh, you should be a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> Work on that someday. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll keep practicing. So, but, you know, so don't be afraid to use flash outdoors. Uh, in the green mode, you know, the, or the fully automatic mode, the that, you know, we're outside, so the camera says, okay, Plenty of light out here, you don't need the flash, so you inherently get these kind of shadow pictures. Um, <laughs> if you want your, you know, if you have a camera that has a pop-up flash, you know, the easiest way to do it is just set the camera to program, and then on the camera itself, you know, don't get your keys out and pry up the flash, there's a button for it, and it'll just pop up. And in program, outdoors on a bright sunny day, yeah, the camera system knows, or even if you're using one of the bigger flashes and you have it turned on, it knows it's not going to try to overpower the sun. It's just going to send out enough light to fill in the shadows uh, for your subjects. So we, there are potential problems. With all any type of ETTL system, either from any, any company manufacturer, you have the problem of bright and dark lit subjects, where you have the ability, what can happen is that pre-flash can get tricked sometimes. And there's works, ways work, to work around that. Um, you know, some of them is you know, lightly colored subjects like this. Or in a situation where there's going to be something very close to the su subject, uh, in the foreground, and then it's actually, you know, her hair is very, you know, light colored, so we're going to get that pre-flash to bounce back to the camera. Um, or in a situation like this, you know, the flash system kind of underexposed the shot because of the bright lights in the background. So the camera says, you know, there's something really bright in your picture, you know, we're going to, you know, have, we're, I'm going to dial the flash down so we don't overpower that type of situ situation. So there's, you know, situations that you can change that. Um, the way we do that is through fla telling the camera system how to meter off the, off the, the pre-flash. And there is an option for evaluative, which is your preset standard. 
the camera system is set to evaluate metering, which kind of links itself to the autofocus point. Where are you focused? And in a situation like the back of a head, you know, if she was closer to you, that's where it focused. And you know, there's potential problems with a lot of backlight situations. The other option you can do is average metering. So instead of, like I said, concentrating on the return of that pre-flash, it says, okay, you know, don't worry so much about the pre-flash. Just give me an overall, sh you know, shot of the situation. Meter off the entire situation. And co you know, concentrate on everything. Kind of give me an average, you know, overall flash picture. So the camera system is less likely to be fooled by extremely bright subjects in the foreground. Uh, a lot of wedding photographers like this option, where you can turn on the flash meter system away from evaluative, and you set it to average. So you have that, you know, less, you know, problem of maybe having some sort of uh, change on that. The way you can activate average flash metering, you know, you can set, you, it's set by the custom function for some cameras. So a lot of the older cameras, you have to go in the custom functions to set it. On the newer cameras now, we actually have a flash menu setting. So the new Rebels, 60D, 70s, Mark IIs, 1DX is a flash control menu. And in that menu, you'll be able to tell your camera, I want you to meter either under the evaluative system and kind of pre concentrate on the pre-flash or the average system and say, you know what, don't concentrate so much on the pre-flash. So you have that choice to try it out. It's a nice thing to test it, you know, give some test shots, you know, before you go out and shooting and see which result you like better. So one of the first, the fundamentals of flash control is having the control of the output of the light. Um, you have, whether the pop-up flash or one of the larger speed lights, you have the ability to control the output. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is get the right amount of exposure. So, and like we said before, the system can get fooled on either highly reflective clothing or extremely dark clothing or dark subjects like a you know black Labrador or something like that. So, you know the the system ha may have the ability to either underexpose or underexpose the system, and we can change that or we have adjustment for that. And it's called <laughs> flash exposure compensation. And flash exposure compensation is a big fancy word for you know flash output. You as the photographer have control of that. How much light do I want my flash to send out? So you can have that kind of control with your system. Because with brightly lit subjects, sometimes you know there's so much pre-flash bouncing back off her tank top saying, OK, something in your photograph is extremely reflective, or it's very, very bright. So I don't want to send out too much flash and overexpose the system. So the camera dials the flash down. Sometimes it you know, from time to time, it'll dial it down too much. With flash exposure compensation, you can dial up your flash output, so this is plus one, and get a proper exposure. So now you have that kind of control from a you know, previous and post type of system. So same thing happens with either light subjects or dark subjects. So the rule of thumb, if it's a, if it's a bright subject, you want to bump your flash output up, or you want to overexpose the flash a little bit. Same thing's true with dark subjects. If it's a dark subject, you want to underexpose. Same thing holds true with exposure, just normal exposure compensation, which is for ambient light. This is flashed exposure compensation for the output of the camera's light. So in a situation, again, white t-shirt, do you, what, do you, what do you want to think? Do we want to overexpose the flash or underexpose the flash? So we, it's a bright subject, so we want to overexpose it. So here we would set it to plus two. Same thing here with her black dress. You know, it's a very dark subject. The, the system said the pre-flash was fired out and it was absorbed by that black dress. So not a lot of light came back through the lens. So we said, OK, you know, the camera said, well, something in your scene is really, really dark. I need to send out a lot of light to, to, to send out light downfield to, uh, to illuminate your subject. Well, the system got tricked by the black dress. So it said, OK, let's dial it back a little bit. So you do that, take another photograph, and this is minus one and a third. And you can use your histograms to kind of figure out you know, what you want to do that. So the rule of thumb, you know, if it's a dark subject, underexpose the flash. If it's a bright subject, you want to overexpose the flash. Now, if you're a wedding photographer, what's the rule of thumb you use? You got a bride and a groom, white dress, black tuxedo. What do you think you want to do? Trick, trick question. You always want to expose for the wedding dress. It's a very expensive wedding dress. The groom, it's a rental tuxedo. He's turning it back in tomorrow. So wedding dress, always exposed for the wedding dress. How do we vary a flash exposure compensation? It kind of depends on the camera model. You know, there's different ways you can do it. The icon is, you know, it's on the camera. On the, on the D cameras, like the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 7, 5 D cameras, we have a button on the, ca the um, camera itself, and it's a downward arrow, and it'll have a plus and minus flash exposure. And that, you'll press that button, turn the rear wheel of the dial, and be able to pick your 
um, flash exposure compensation. Now on the cameras that do that, you'll notice that on that screen up here, you'll have your little exposure compensation. That's your normal exposure compensation. If you apply flash exposure compensation, the screen goes black or goes um, turns off except for that little meter. And then since we don't have two meters on the screen, you'll see the flash plus or minus icon on your camera, and that just tells you that there has been an adjustment. Once you tap out of the menu, you're just that little meter on there again is just your normal exposure compensation or your normal light meter. You're not going to see your adjustment done. So if you do minus one flash exposure, tap the shutter button again, you'll just see the icon on there, but you're not going to see the minus one because again that meter goes back to normal um, exposure compensation or your normal ambient light meter if you're in manual exposure. So on the Rebel cameras, um, go into the menu system, you can go to the flash uh, exposure comp menu or you go into your flash uh, control menu and you'll go into the menu option and you can actually dial up or dial down your fl flash output by using your uh, arrow keys in the back of the camera. And then but you can dial left is underexposed, right is overexposed, just like normal exposure compensation. So and once you dial it up, press set to lock in that setting. Once it's set, it's going to stay there. Go back to the green mode, it's full automatic, it'll go back to kind of a zero or pick itself out. But if you go back to program or shutter priority, aperture priority, or manual, it will reapply that ex flash exposure compensation. Even if you turn the camera off, pull the battery, charge it, put it back in, start shooting again, if you have your flash set to plus one, it'll always memorize that. So a question comes up, I get, you know, from a photographer, John, all my flash pictures are really, really bright, what's going on? And first thing I'll ask, you know, is your flash exposure compensation set? Oh, I said it like a month ago. I don't know if I, I don't think I've changed it since. And that's usually what it is. You have to bring that back down to zero. So, or make those adjustments as you're shooting. On the 60D, it's, instead of using the arrow keys, you can use the real, wheel too. So, um, but we, you know, either it's going to be in a little menu icon. This is a Rebel XTI screen. Uh, otherwise, you can use the normal um, flash control menu. If you have a speed light, it just makes it very, very simple. Um, you can just plug the speed light into the camera, and you can press. This is on a 430 EX2, or even on the 600s or the new or the older 580s. Uh, you can press the set button and then use the plus or minus uh, arrow keys to turn your flash exposure up or down. So you can have that kind of control, and then you'll see on the screen. Again, we see the same icon, downward arrow with the plus and minus, and you'll see plus one third, which means we, this flash has been set to plus one third flash exposure compensation. One thing to note though is if you are changing flash exposure on the uh, bigger flashes that have the wheel control on it, like a 580EX2 or even the new 600s, um, you can have that wheel always just kind of be active <laughs> for flash exposure compensation, or you have to press the set button, then turn it either way, whatever you want to do, you have that kind of control through a custom function. So you can have plus or minus and just rotate the wheel clockwise or counterclockwise. And same thing will happen up on the screen. You'll see the little plus or minus flash icon plus one third. Now the question comes up, well I can control it from the camera and I can also control it on the flash. What happens if I set minus one on the camera and then plus one on the flash? Which one's going to be, um, which one's the camera going to use? If you set, you know, both area, if you set a flash exposure compensation from on both the camera and the flash menu, um, the flash will take priority. You physically touch the flash, went up to change your settings. And so even if you have minus two exposure compensation on the camera, and you have plus one set of the flash, your flash exposure will be plus one. So be mindful on that. All right, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, again, using your flash outside. Don't be afraid to use your, pop -up, your flash, either pop up or the external flash outside. Now, it's nice because it does fill in the shadows. So we have that ability to, you know, fill it in. Um, and if you have your camera set to program, and that's basically the easiest way to do that is, you know, program any of the automatic exposure, program TV or AV you can have that kind of balanced fill light uh, indoors. When you go, um, or excuse me, when you go out, when you're outdoors. If you go indoors, you have the ability to blend your flash, doesn't matter if it's the pop-up or the one of the bigger flashes, with the ambient light of the room. So here's a program flash, you know, telling the system in program mode, just, you know, light up my subject, that's it. Don't worry about the ambient light. You know, if it's a pop-up flash, 10 to 15 feet. If it's one of the bigger flashes, a little more flashlights, so you're gonna have a little more power. So you're just telling your system, just light up my subject. And that's how it works in program. If you have the camera system set to either shutter priority or aperture priority, or you can do this in manual also if you want to, 
And you say, okay, now I want you to blend your, my on-camera flash with the ambient light of the room. What will happen now, you get a flash picture that looks like this. So we go from program shot to ambient light shot. So it's still a flash picture. What we did is just set the camera to AV mode in this situation. Picked a you know, nominal aperture, nothing too crazy. I think it was f4 or f5.6 and took another photograph. And so the on-camera flash, it's still a flash picture, but it blends with the ambient light of the room. And so you get a much more brighter picture that way. Same thing can happen with the shutter priority mode. You know, you know, you're going to attempt to expose the you know, on-camera flash with the background. So again, program mode, kind of basic mode, we're lit up our subject, but that's about it. Now watch how the background light will come into play here when we use this you know, fill flash with the ambient light. So it's a great technique in very controlled situations. So some, some things can happen when you're shooting really dark situations, like in an aperture priority mode, if you want to work with apertures and you want to work, you're shooting in a really dark situation and there's not a lot of ambient light, what can happen is the camera says, okay, for me to get in a proper exposure, I'm going to need a really slow shutter speed. And so what can happen sometimes, it can give you a kind of a blur effect. So in the AV mode, just be aware that if it's a really dark situation, you will have it, you know, can sometimes get that really um, blurred looking shot. So, so slow shutter speeds can, you know, can, you know, lead to like accidental blurring of people. So, um, so just kind of be aware of it. So that's how you can do it. You know, sometimes, you know, if all you want is just a normal sharp picture, you know, sometimes the program mode is going to be a, a better shot because in program, the camera will never shoot below a 60th of a second indoors. So, in the AV mode, you kind of have a, you have a kind of an option. Um, in the custom functions of the cameras, you can tell, tell the camera, okay, I like to shoot in AV mode a lot. But the problem I'm coming into is that the camera wants to, it's a really dark wedding reception, for example, and I'm, gonna get, I'm getting eighth of a second exposures. What happens? What can I do to fix that? Well, in the custom functions of the camera, you can go in and say, okay, one of the options says, in AV mode, you can do one of three things. You can tell the camera, you know what? I'm really steady. Pick any shutter speed you want. I don't, eighth of a second, doesn't matter. You know, any shutter speed you want to, get, to give me a proper balance between on-camera flash and the ambient light. Again, problem would be, would be that it can drop below you know, a safe shutter speed for handhold shooting. One of the other options in the custom functions is the fact you can tell it, okay, in AV mode, you know, don't drop below a 60th of a second. Go a 60th to, to whatever my flash sync speed is. So now it's, you, know, you, you can still work your apertures, it just won't drop below that 60th of a second um, shutter speed. The third option is that is that, you know what, when I'm in AV mode, shoot at my fastest or at my sync speed. So on a Rebel, it would be a 250th of a second, uh, excuse me, a 200th of a second, or on a 7D, it would be a 250th of a second. So in the custom function, you can kind of tailor what you want to do. A lot of times when I'm shooting you know, fast action with flash, um, what I'll do, especially if, I'm in, if I want to work with my apertures or I want to have kind of control of aperture priority, what I'll do is say, OK, I'll set my camera to manual. So now I'm not worried about the light meter in the camera because that's just for ambient light. But I'll tell it, you know what, I want a, you know, I want a you know, 50th of a second and then just leave it at a 50th or a 200th of a second if, I want, if I'm trying to freeze the action. So I'll you know, use the manual mode and say, and say, say, okay, set it to manual, I pick a shutter speed, it stays there, and then I work my aperture. You know, and the, the flash system is all smart enough to know and it, it'll, it'll work and play with that for you. So, and I just set to the fastest shutter speed. So if I'm doing indoor sports and I want to freeze the action a little bit, um, and I'm using a 7D, I'll set it to a 250th of a second. And then I'll you know work my apertures 2.8, you know f2, f4, whatever I want to do. So, and then I have you know no worry of that system picking a slow shutter speed. Um, if you want to minimize the background, you can pick a low ISO. If you want to see more of the backgrounds again or have more distance to your flash, you can raise your ISOs. So, but it's a nice way of working with uh, fast action, low light situations. So, all right. So that's kind of just kind of an overview of ETTL, um, the average metering system, the uh, evaluative metering system for the flashes. So talk a little bit about flash controls. You know, one of the bigger, biggest benefits of having an extra speed light is the ability to so you can bounce the flash, you know, up off the ceiling. 
or off the wall if you want to. So you can angle that head left or right or up and down. And that does a really nice way of having that kind of control. The system all talks to each other. You know, the flash knows what lens is on the camera. The lens knows, you know, what camera it's on, what flash is attached. Everything talks back and forth. So if you do want to bounce your flash, you know, it's, there isn't any, you know, menu system or anything that you have to change. You just grab the flash, press the button on the flash, and you just point it towards the ceiling. And so why would we want to bounce a flash? Well, a direct flash picture can give you kind of harsh shadows. So as long as your ceilings are low enough, we usually say about 10 feet or so. You know, cathedral, if you're outdoors, you've got to have really low clouds um, if you want to bounce flash. But for the most part, um, indoors, lo uh, low ceilings, you can bounce the flash. And you see the, the photograph on the right has a much softer looking shot to it. So it's a much softer picture. So the light is going up off the ceiling and kind of coming down and cascading, cascading our subject. Same thing works, you know, direct flash picture. You know, we get fall off because the flash is like a headlight. It doesn't go very far. So if I point the, the flash towards the ceiling, take another picture, again, we're getting that much more soft light uh, versus kind of a direct harsh light system. Same thing goes for bouncing it left and right. Uh, the only flash we have in our lineup that doesn't swivel left and right is the little baby uh, EX, uh, 270EX2 flash. That only goes up and down. So if you want to bounce the flash off the wall, you know, or you don't want, or you know, here we are direct right at the, at the, at the um, American flag, I can put, swivel the camera a little bit or swivel the flash head and take another picture and point the light just like a headlight. You know, you can point it in whatever direction you want. So you don't have to either do direct flash, you can also swivel it. And again, all we're doing is pointing the flash a little bit back towards our subject. So that's one way of, of, able, of you able to be able to do that too. So you have that can kind of control of bounce and swivel. Again, nothing you have to change the menu, nothing you have to set, just point it wherever you want to do it. Now, if you're going to bounce it off the ceiling, and you know, make sure they're, they're you know, white ceilings or even a gray ceiling or something like that because it'll come back down. If they're bright pink, you're, you're going to give off kind of a, a pink cast onto your subject. Same thing if you're going to bounce it off a wall. Um, co very colored walls, like red walls and stuff, you're going to get kind of a red cast onto your, onto your subject. So um, make sure, be wearful of what <laughs> types of uh, colors you're actually working with. We talked a little bit earlier when, I, when we first started off, we said, okay, the fastest you can, you can shoot with the pop-up flash or in the normal flashes in the automatic modes is your safest flash sync. Which, for the, again, for the 5Ds and the Rebels, is about a two hundredth of a second. On the 60Ds and the 7D cameras and 1Ds cameras, it's going to be a two hundred fifty of a second. Now, what happens if you want to shoot faster than that? Well, with the pop-up flash, you hit your limitation because the pop-up flash does not have this next option. Um, the extra flashes, the bigger ones, have the ability to use a feature called high-speed sync. And high-speed sync allows you to shoot at any shutter speed you want. Because normally, if on this little on the 7D, if I set the camera to a thousandth of a second, and as soon as I pop the flash up, boom, we're back down to a 250th. Now, if I put one of the extra speed lights on there, you know, four series, the three series, you know, the six series in flashes, I can go into the flat, I can press a button on the flash and engage what we call high speed sync, and now I can shoot at any shutter speed I want to. There are a few limitations. Um, fully automatic is still operational. There's nothing, there's nothing else you have to set. And camera and flash exposure modes all work the same. The button on the flash is has a, represented by downward arrow, which represents flash, with an H next to it, and that's going to give you high speed sync. So what you do, you know, where do I want to use high speed sync? Well, if I want, if I'm outside on a bright sunny day, and I want to shoot with shallow depth of fields, let's say f4, and I want to blur the background a little bit. Normally at a 200th of a second at f4 on a sunny day, we're going to be overexposed. So with high speed sync. I can use flash outside, I can shoot at a four thousandth of a second at f4, and I can blur the background out on a, on, a, on a bright and sunny day. One of the greatest things you can do is high speed sync. Some people think, well, high speed sync, I can shoot at any shutter speed. You know, I can shoot at faster shutter speeds to, you know, freeze a, a bullet going through an apple or something like that. It's more used in this type of application where I want to be able to shoot at any shutter speed I want to. Question came up one time, well, John, do I have to worry about turning high speed sync on and off? Nope. If you leave it on and you go dip back down below or at flash sync or below, the system's smart enough. It's not, you know, so you can just leave it on all the time if you want to. So faster shutter speeds, 
You can freeze the action in daylight. Shoot out, shoot out, um, shoot out shallow depth, <laughs> shallow depth of field um, on a bright and sunny day. So you can use wide apertures. Um, you can minimize that kind of unsightly background again because we have the ability to shoot um, at that shutter speed. You can also tone down the background. You know, here we go. It's again, it's a, it's, it's properly exposed, but it's, everything's pretty hot. We call it a really kind of bright. So this is a two hundredth of a second. Again, here's a five hundredth of a second. So you have that the ability to do that. You can freeze subjects as long as you have you know bright and so, bright and you know enough light to do it. Now there's a downfall of high speed sync because you're like, well, why don't we just use high speed sync all the time and why don't I just set it to an eight thousandth of a second constantly all the time? Well, the problem with high speed sync, or now the, you know one thing you have to be aware of is that when you do engage high speed sync, you go above your sync speed. So let's say on a 7D, I can shoot at 250th of a second normally. Let's say I go to 500th of a second. What happens is your flash output, or how much distance that light is giving off, goes down and down and down and down and down. So at a 4,000th of a second, my distance of this flash is only about 5 feet. So it's not very far. And the reason it's doing that is that when we talked about, um, you know, when you take a picture, the first curtain goes up and the second curtain follows up, how fast that second curtain follows is your flash sync speed. So on a 7D here, we have, you know, 250th of a second. First one goes up. One 250th of a second later, the second sh shutter comes up behind it. When I, let's say, shoot at a 4,000th of a second, what is happening is the first sh sh shutter is going up, and then one 4,000th of a second later, the second shutter is following that shutter up along. That's why if it's a really dark situation, we have really dark exposures. Now, if I shot a picture right now in here with these lights turned down at a 4,000th of a second, everything's extremely, extremely dark. What the flash is doing, since there's just a little slit coming across the sensor, is at a 4,000th of a second, the flash is actually firing out 4,000 bursts of light in one second. So it's going pop, 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 pop. And it's actually painting that sensor as it pans across that, um, as those shutters blades pan across the sensor. So therefore, since the flash has to recycle and fire 4,000 little flashes within a second, the distance is obviously your power on the flash is going to go down quite a bit, and so the distance is also goes down. So be kind of aware of what high speed sync. There are some limitations. Works out really well though. I use it a lot of times when I'm doing, you know, we're doing shoots outside. We want to shallow up the field, you know, like shoot. The working distance is about you know four or five feet. Shooting the you know model or shooting the family outside, and I want to you know blur the background. I want to use a really shallow depth of field. And I can do that with, and I still want to add some light. I want to use some flash. So, another thing the system that you can do with these uh, flashes is turn on what we call second curtain sync. So the system, the flash will fire at the end of a long exposure versus at the beginning of of a long exposure. And what will happen is, you know, motion trailing, you know, the light it looks more natural because it's going to come at the end of the exposure. So. As, the, as she walks towards it, you can see the lights from the candles are kind of streaming back through the shot. Otherwise, it almost looks like it's coming backwards. So second curtain sync is a nice feature, too. It's on the flashes themselves, and it's represented by this uh, three arrows. So it's when the flash will actually fire. Another feature you can do with flashes, and it doesn't matter if it's the big flashes or the little pop-up flash, is you can spot meter your flash. You can force what we call the pre-flash. And we call it flash exposure lock. And in a situation like this, with the little girl on the right-hand side, and what's happening is that that barn in the background inherently is really, really dark. So what we do, or what the system normally does, is when we take a picture, I'm, I can focus lock on the little girl, pan the camera to the left, and take the picture. This is the kind of shot I get. Because that pre-flash, again, is going into the back of that barn, and the camera says, wow, that barn is really, really dark. I'm going to send out as much light as I can to light up this scene. Well, the, the downfall is that she gets overexposed because she's off the edge. Because we focus locked on her, recomposed, and then took the picture. What I can do is I can force the pre-flash on her. And the way I do that is I can press on the back of your camera, you all have a little asterisk button, which is your spot meter or your exposure lock button. And it's the same button when the flash is turned on as flash exposure lock. Now you do have to let your subject know that there is going to be a burst of light. It's not the actual picture. But I can f point the camera at, the, at her, force the pre-flash on the system when I have it turned on. 
because we reprogrammed our camera. So force the pre-flash, the camera reads that distance between you and the subject. It'll hold that information for about 16 seconds. I can focus on her, recompose, and then send out that light. And instead of getting a picture like that, we get a picture like this. So that's what we can use flash exposure lock. It works well for you know, large, deep subjects where you want to focus and recompose and maybe not have them off the edge, and the flash isn't trying to light up the back of a room. So, but you do have to let your subjects know that, that that pop of light is not the actual picture. So it takes a little bit of extra work. Can you say that again with the order? You press that first and then yep. focus on it? It, it will, really won't matter. The, the question was you know, the, 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 the sequence. You know, I can focus on her, force the pre-flash, recompose, take the picture. Normally, I'll force the pre-flash, focus lock, recompose, take the photograph. So, and all you're doing is forcing that pre-flash. If you don't do that, you have the capability of, or the problem where you come across this because now, this focus lock, recompose, it's trying to light up the back of that barn. So, we can force the light out. So, and it will read it for about, it'll hold that you know, distance reading, that light reflectivity reading for about um, 16 seconds. So the reading will normally dis disappear within about two seconds. If you want to hold that reading so you're not constantly doing, you know, free, free flash, recompose, take the picture, you know, if you don't want to constantly have to come back and re-fire that pre flash, what you can do is press that shutter button halfway down, and when you take the picture, only let it up halfway. So don't let your finger all the way off, and it will memorize that pre flash. So pre flash take the picture and then just bring your finger up halfway and just keep taking the picture and you don't have to redo that pre-flash, it'll, it'll memorize that. When you do let your finger completely off the shutter button, then it resets the system, you have to, fire, you have to do it again. So. The flashes themselves, you can go into the menus of course. And we have external flash settings. You can go into your flash control menus. A lot of the cameras now have the ability to go into the custom functions. The owner's manual will tell you what the custom functions of the flashes will be. So um, the back of the camera, or the back of the flash, excuse me, on the new EX2 flashes, or anything that has a Mark II on it, um, or the new 600, you can, in your camera is one of the newer cameras, uh, you can control all operations of the flash from the camera menu. And then your menu, menu will come up and you can have that kind of control. Um, so you can go into your custom functions and change it. The nice thing about changing custom functions and stuff of the flash on the camera is that it'll actually lay out the whole option of that flash versus just, you know, see, you know, custom function one, and it just says one or zero for on or off. You don't have to get the owner's manual out. So, all right. Any questions on anything we've covered so far? Question in the back. The question was with off-camera flashes, which we're going to cover here next. Um, excellent lead away. But what it will do, the question was, will the off-camera flashes maintain ETTL? And the answer is yes, either on the radio system or the infrared system, which we'll talk about here next. So you can have as many flashes off-camera as you want, and all that ETTL data is being talked back and forth. And here, yes, sir. Question was, you know, when you're using um, the metering systems, we have average or evaluative, and when you're using flash um, exposure lock, which is that what we just demonstrated with the pre-flash um, uh, firing, honestly, it really wouldn't matter a whole lot which one you're using because you're firing it off and it's reading it off. The evaluative is going to look more at the pre-flash, so you might get a little bit more um, constant situations uh, where the average is going to still look at the pre-flash, but not as hardcore. So, a good question. Yes, sir. When you use a flash exposure function, compensation. Compensation. Um, you're not setting. Uh, you're not changing any settings in the camera, right? The, yeah. When you're changing the output of the flash. Right. The question was, when you're changing flash exposure compensation, what are you changing? You're actually, yeah, you're not changing any exposure settings of the camera. You're actually changing the output of the flash, like a dimmer switch. You know, we have normal, we have more power or less power, and that's what you're doing with flash exposure compensation. 
is you're actually changing the output of the flash. You're not changing your shutter speeds or apertures or ISO. You're actually changing the output of that flash. Good question. Yes, sir. When you use flash exposure mode, is it sensitive to whether or not you have one focus point or both are open selected? The question was when you use flash exposure lock, is it, is it sensitive to one spot or your one focus point or have all of them activated? No, it doesn't matter. So you can you can have them all activated if you want to, or you can just have one. They're two independent of each other. You're you're doing the pre-flash, and then you're focusing and then recomposing. But when so. it, when it does its metering, mm -hmm. will it? Do you have, for example, just one focus point selected? Meter off of a smaller area that you have all of them selected. Uh, just so I get the question correct. So you're do, whether or not you have the one focus point active and you move it around, or if you have all the active points active, is what you're saying? Right. In other words, it is informed by. And then are you, right. So the, your, your, your question comes back to, are you using like a spot meter for the ambient light? Yes. Okay, so you're using spot meter on, let's say, a 3.5% of the center of the photo, and then you have the flash metering system also. Um, there, the, 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 the actual, you, you know, we have on the cameras, we have evaluative, or we have average metering, we have center weighted metering, spot metering, partial metering. That's for ambient light. So that has nothing to do with flash. Um, and then on the flash side, we have that pre-flash, the reflective light metering. And it will either say, okay, the, the evaluative system looks off the, you know, primarily the pre-flash, or average kind of says, okay, I'm just going to, I'm not going to concentrate so much on how much light's coming back through it. I'm going to look at the whole scene. Um, for large groups of people, a lot of times, a lot of wedding photographers really do like the average setting better. So, all right, so we'll move on here to, you know, using our cameras, using our flash, excuse me, off camera. So, a couple of different options. We have our, we have cables. Uh, we have an off-camera shoe cord. It's like an extension cord for the hot shoe. Um, start stretching these things out really far. Uh, you have you can come into problems, but you know for normal flash bracket type of work, it's nice because you can pull the flash off the camera. And the nice thing about having the flash away from the camera is that you can position it in different situations. So instead of having a straight flat light um, with a little cable, you can move the flash. You know maybe you're on a tripod, and even with one of the smaller flashes, you can start moving the flash around the camera and around your subject and start changing the shadow look. So you can see as we kind of shift between here, watch the shadows and how they grow. Or if you're doing macro work and you want a side light type situation, um, you can have a single light you know, sitting off to the camera. Um, and again, you can either tr trigger it now uh, with an off of um, an infrared trigger. The pop-up flash can trigger it also. So now we're going to talk, talk about you know, getting the flash away from the camera. Um, and it really will change the look of your pictures. Almost one, you know, a lot of professional photographers that you'll talk to, you know, the worst place for a flash is sitting right on the camera, directly right at your subject. So the more you can get it away from your you know, the camera, um, the better light output you get. So we'll talk about wireless ETTL flash systems, and we have the ability now to have flashes off camera. You know, and everything is still ETTL. Everything we talked about so far still holds true. You know, the system is also you know completely smart enough to be able to trigger flashes off camera and it's not just full power or it's not just half power they're always talking to each other back to the camera um, and we have a couple different options a couple way, different ways we can do that uh, you can trigger any flash that's currently in our lineup with the pop-up flash from these cameras so the 7d the 60d the rebel t4i and the rebel t3i the little pop-up flash has the ability to infra, under the infrared system trigger any flash that's in our light up in our, in our lineup and you can, in, under the infrared system, you can trigger as many flashes as you want. You know, this little pop-up flash can trigger, if everybody in this classroom right now, there's about 35, 40 of you, if you all had a flash out, turn it on, set it to slave, I can trigger every one of them. So there's not actually a, a limited number of flashes. Now, are you going to go out and buy 50 flashes? Be, you know, we're not going to have any problem with being able to, if you want to go out and buy 50 flashes today. Got Question. It. Yeah, it has to be line of sight. With infrared, the question was, does it have to be line of sight? And with infrared, it does. There is a certain line of sight. Um, with these types of flashes, you know, if I wanted to light up you, and I had it maybe sitting a little bit in front of me, I would just point the infrared receiver back towards me. So this is the, the front of the flash is the infrared receiver. Now, what if I want to take a picture and I have my camera here and I want to put a flash behind me? Well, we are in an enclosed room, and we've all know that with our television remotes, that you can point it at a wall and your TV channel will still change. So we can bounce it off the walls in a pretty, in as long as it's a smaller uh, location. Cathedrals and stuff, yeah, they start gonna, it's going to start bouncing around. So if you're outside on a, really, on a bright and sunny day, yeah, one of the key things you're going to do is point that 
receiver back towards you if you have your flash on the light stand. Or you have what we call a voice activated light stand, which is the person that walks around and you tell them where to hold the flash. So if you have a VAL, voice activated light stand, or if you have just a normal light stand that doesn't talk to you, you don't have to pay them as much, then you can just you know, set your camera up and have them pointed back towards you. But it is line of sight, and that's with the infrared system. So with the pop-up flash, you do have some control though. You know, it's not just trigger the flashes and this is part of the picture also. You can go into the, your flash menu, and this is the, the, on the Rebel T3i, T4i, 60D, and 7D. You can go into your menu, and the first menu all the way down is called flash control. Um, and then you can go into your flash control, and it says, okay, what do I, what I, what do I, what do I want to do? You can turn the hot shoe on and off if flash and fire enabled. And if we go down to built-in flash settings, scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see here's our flash exposure compensation we talked about. There's ETTL evaluative or average we talked about. And the bottom one says wireless function enable or disable. And if you go into that menu, you get four options, technically. You get disabled, which means the pop-up flash is just that. It's a pop-up flash. Now, the second option. You see an icon that has a picture of a little speed light, and you see a picture icon of a pop-up flash. That means that you can control a ratio now. You can control the output or a ratio between your external lights, not just one, you can do multiples if you want to, and the onboard flash. So you're going to get a basically, I can say, okay, I want maybe my output flash to be a little bit less. So I can dial a ratio down, from, and I still have a you know, pop-up flash light coming off here. I'll still see light coming off here, and this is still part of my exposure. This flash is still going to be part of the exposure. But I can do kind of a ratio now. I can control the, between the two of them. So I can do 8 to 1, or you know, 4 to 1, 1 to 1 power if I want to. The third option down where you don't see the icon of the pop-up flash. A lot of people like this one because all, that now, all, all this is now is a trigger. This flash is now not part of the exposure. All this is going to do is trigger your off-camera flashes as many as you want to buy. So you can, you know, 3, 4, 5, 2 if you want to, or just 1. And so now you're saying, okay, I can, you know, I can still control them. I can still power, I can have flash exposure compensation. I can dial it up or down. I can still control, you know, different ratios between two flashes. Let's say if I have a group B flash and a group A flash, and I want a little more power from here, a little less power from here, I can do that. You still have full control of everything. But this is now not, not part of the exposure. Now the trick comes in is when I do that, you will still see a pop of light coming off this camera. And what that is, is that is the, the, the ETTL pre-flash system working and the infrared, uh, white light infrared system going off to trigger your cameras. So when people set that third option, I always get a phone call or a, you know, something comes up and says, you know, John, I have it set, but I'm still getting you know, light coming off of there. That's fine. That's just the trigger. So that's just light coming off just to trigger your system. It's not part of the exposure. The third, op or the, well, the last option on that menu is, is you see the little flash icon, a plus, and then the pop-up flash. That means they all fire at the same power. So everything is at same power now. You don't have your ratio controls, you're just firing at same power. Um, now that being said that these extra flashes will actually come down in power to meet this flash. Because obviously this little flash here is not as powerful as these. So you do have some control of how you want to do it. So again, disabled, which means you're just normal flash output. And this, is, this menu has to do only with the pop-up flash. Second one is the ratio between the on-camera, the, the pop-up flash and the, third, and the your extra flashes. Third one is, this is not part of the exposure, you're just controlling output of the other flashes. Last one is everything's at the same power. <coughs> so that's how you have control of that one now too. Now if you don't have a pop-up infrared transmitter, so if you have an older Rebel, like a Rebel T2i, or you have a T1i, or Rebel XS, or the original 5D, or the new 5D, Mark III, and you still want to do an infrared flash system, we have an infrared transmitter. And this is basically just the bottom half of either a 5 series or 600 series flash, where it's just going to be an infrared transmitter. About 40 feet indoors, and this is the same with the pop-up flash, you know, indoor infrared is going to be uh, about 40 feet outdoors, about 30 feet, a little bit less. If it's a really bright and sunny day, you might be a little less of that, so it is, a, it is an infrared signal. Uh, it is line of sight like we talked about before. If you want to do and get away, if you want to get away from the infrared system and you want to get into what we call the radio system, then we have a couple different options for radio triggering. We have the new STE3, which is basically just a radio transmitter. It looks like the back of a 600, it's a little smaller, um, and it's basically just a setting tr trigger for all of our other 600s. The only flash that's in our lineup that is radio frequency is the 600 EXRT. Um, 
cannon will guarantee exposure or distance firing for about 100 feet, technically 98, but about 100 feet. Um, I have gone a little farther than that. So if you're like, well, I need 150 feet, and you know, cannon says only 98, you know, I have gone a little farther than just the, the normal you know, 98 feet, but we'll pretty much guarantee the 98 feet on that. Um, and another nice thing is that there's no line of sight. It's, all, it's a radio trigger. So you can point it, put the flashes in soft boxes. You can put them uh, behind something, anywhere you want, and then you can trigger it. Everything is still ETTL. So, and we're going to go through, I'll plug the camera in, we'll kind of walk through setup here in a little bit too. The other thing you can do on your, if you want to do radio is actually have a 600 um, on the camera. And with a 600 on the camera now, you can have this head be part of the exposure or not if you want to and just use the trigger. Uh, one benefit of having a 600 versus a transmitter as a trigger is that you do get the infrared uh, AF assist beam. So that's nice also. So if you want to do the infrared assist beam, that will have, have that ability too. And you can turn the head off. So it's not part of the picture. Or you can have it on. It's up to you. You can, you can vary the output of everything if you want to. Um, again, we'll guarantee about 100 feet on there, no line of sight. Um, and it'll work with all of our other 600 speed lights in the system. So the traditional optical or infrared system, like I said, everything in the lineup works. So the 270s up to the 600s, um, every, you know, as long as it has a slave switch on it or slave menu option, you can go into the system and engage that type of system for being, having off-camera flashes. So that is no problem there. We actually can even go back into some of the older cameras too, or excuse me, older speed lights. Um, so even the, you know, so 600 EXRTs, I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see them up there. But the previous 580s and 550s can also be a slave. Um, all the way back to the 420 EX, so they can all be slave flashes. So if you've got some old flashes laying around, they can be remote slaves. So, so the kind of a breakdown. You know, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to trigger your flashes via the infrared signal or the radio system? Well, what do you need to do that? Well, you need either have a five series speed light set to master. You can have a transmitter, or you can use the pop-up flash. If you want to do the radio system, uh, you can. You have to have either a STE3 transmitter or a 600. Now you'll see that the 600 is, set in, is basically in both options. The 600 EXRT is a master both versus radio or infrared. And it is also a slave, or basically a remote flash, on infrared or radio. Now it cannot do both at the same time. Everything has to be set to radio or everything has to be set to infrared. So you can't fire two 600s via radio and then a, a 580 via infrared. Everything has to be set to infrared. Or everything has to be set to radio. So. Just kind of be mindful of that. So triggering master units, again, 580s, 600s, the transmitter, the pop-up flash, however you want to do that. Um, and then what you have control of that now is this is the neat thing about the whole system. It's not just the flash is on and then we're done. You know, what if you want to have some control of it? Well, we have different ratios. Uh, we have the capability of setting uh, two ratios, A, B, or A, B, and C on the infrared system. Um, gives you full control over lighting. So you, can, you don't have to reposition, you don't have to you know, go walk over to your flashes and dial up more power or less power. Everything is controlled from the camera. Um, on the 7D camera, you do get the ability to control what we call group C, which is like we usually use as a hair light. And if you have a flash set to C channel, you can have control of that output. And the neat, neatest thing about the whole system is that, let's say if you had two shooters at, a, at an event, and you had, you, know, a, a, you had a couple lights set up and, you know, the system reacts to each individual camera. It doesn't react to, there's nothing you set on the flash and it just stays there. You can set it to manual and it'll stay there, but if you want to use ETTL, you know, if I want to shoot at a flash exposure of plus one, and Steve wants to shoot at minus one, you know, so, and, and then Dave wants to shoot at, you know, plus three. As long as we don't do one, two, three, click, and fire them all at the same time, but if we're just shooting, the flashes will react to, in, to our cameras and to our camera settings. So you have a lot of, you know, a lot of control of that. Um, in our normal system, we consider our A group as our main light, B is our secondary light, and then we have C as what we call a hair light. Um, and that's how we kind of, in the Canon world, is how we look at it. So let's say a setup like this one. You know, we've got a 7D uh, with the pop-up flash turned on, so we've got the pop-up flash up, but it's set to disabled. So there's no, this, this light is not going to be part of the exposure. Firing into umbrellas, I've got a 600 EXRT, you know, set to infrared. And we've got another 600 RT set to infrared, but we're in the B group. So main light's from the left, secondary light is on the right, and, and we have our subject. So again, but no flash coming off of the actual camera. 
we look, we take a picture, and now you can see on the bottom of the screen here as we show you is right now the, the flash AB ratio. This is done on the menu. You can do this in the back of the camera. You can do this on the STE2 transmitter, um, back of the flash. But we have it set to 8 to 1. So the B flash is now firing 8 times to, to, to its normal power, to the 1 power. And that's why there's more light coming onto the left hand, of, left hand side of the face. From the camera, so I don't have to walk over to the flash, from the camera I can make an adjustment and take another picture. And let's dial the flash down a little bit. So now we go 4 to 1, you know, 2 to 1. And watch how the light, and again, photography means painting with light, but watch how the light moves across her face. So we can now go to 1 to 1. And then we can go the other way now, 2 to 1, 4 to 1, and then 8 to 1. So now you can go back. So I can go back and forth through here and kind of paint my light however I want to. And so you know that's not Photoshop. She does change her position a little bit. So, but as you can walk through. Now what if I want to add a third light? I can go into my firing groups and with the 7D I have the ability to control now a C group. And normally we have A, B, and C which means they fire basically at the same power but in their respective outputs. A is main, B is secondary, C is hair light. The second one down is just you're going to do A, B ratio. On the 7D we have the ability to add A, B ratio with a C group and what that means is now, here's the menu, what it looks like. I can scroll down here to my group C exposure compensation and I can dial that up and down. Just like we talked about with flash exposure compensation. So again, everything means the same. We have B group, um, A group, disabled, and then we now add a third hair light firing into an umbrella. And so now we have one to one AB. And then now watch as we increase the output of this, the hair light, we can watch the back of her head. And we, as we turn the, the flash up, we can increase the hair light. And again, I'm not changing, you know, if, if I wanted to shoot just like this, no problem. I could shoot this all day long. If Steve wanted to have this control, but he's like, you know what, instead of at zero, I want to have plus one hair light. That's fine. He has, has, he has his camera set to how he wants to shoot. I have my camera set to how I want to shoot. And we can just continuously, both of us, shoot and not change anything on the lights. And so you can control it and up to plus one, up plus, plus two, even plus three. So that's how the wireless infrared, actually the radio system works almost identically, it's just the same, it's, you're just under a radio frequency versus the infrared signal. So the limitations of the radio system is that, sorry, you can only, you, the no, maximum number of flashes in the radio system is only 15. So if you want to buy 50 flashes, you want to trigger them all, you have to use um, the infrared system. The radio system triggering system is only, is, is set into only 15 flashes. So, um, yes? So you have 15, you have five, you can set five to group A, three to group B. Yeah, the question is, you know, how, you know, because we have A, B, C, actually we have D and E into the radio system. Yeah, you can mix and match them all. You don't have to have A, B, C, D, you know, you can put 10 in one and, you know, one flash in the secondary group. And these, these ratios only pertain to CTL, right? Yep. Is it the, and if you want to set the flash to manually, then you would have to walk over and then change it. So if you want 164th power, 132nd power, you, you physically walk over to the flash and change that. With the, uh, the 600 RC? Yep. As well, you have to physically? Yeah, it'll, it'll send the signal up, but you're basically turning off the electronic system, and the flashes are set, and you can still have a little bit of control of them, too, exposure compensation-wise. So, um, one caveat on the infrared, on the radio versus the infrared system. On a 600 speed light, since it is an infrared and a radio master and slave, and if I want to trigger multiple 600s under the infrared system on a 7D, no limitations. Everything works fine. Um, it's when you switch over to radio, there is an, an asterisk or what we call it, you know, there is a caveat. On all the cameras that came out this year, and that would include the Rebel T4i, the 60D, or excuse me, the uh, T4i, the 5D Mark III, the 1DX, um, actually the new mirrorless camera, the EOS M, and the new 6D that's coming out in December, our new full frame camera. No limitations on radio, on radio packaging. If you want to use an older camera, like a 7D or a 5D Mark II, and you want to do a radio system, and you either have a transmitter on the camera or a 600 as a, on the camera um, as a radio system, uh, we will, it'll work, but we will guarantee, your flash sync speed drops one full stop for guaranteed exposure. So you'll see a little explanation point show up on the camera, or on the flash, and says it knows it's on one of the older cameras. And on a 7D, my normal sync speed is a 2 50th of a second. Now if I want to guarantee exposure, I just, I'll have to lower my exposure, my shutter speed down to a 1 25th of a second. 
for guaranteed. Now I've tried it, gone up a little faster to 200, 250th, and it still looks good, but if there's a dark frame or something didn't work out, it's because I was above that threshold. So 5D Mark II, you'd be down to a hundredth of a second, so it's one full stop slower. Infrared system, everything is completely, uh, works fine. But on the radio system, um, on the older cameras, and you're gonna do a ra multiple radio flash system, it's gonna be, one, we'll guarantee exposure one full stop slower. If you're just using a 600 on here, everything's fine. It's just when you're using a 600 or a transmitter in a radio system. What is, is uh, your sync speed will, is, will guarantee sync speed at one full stop slower. So, question, sir. I'll, I'm, I'm going to plug the, the camera in and I'll go through the menu system and it's just a button you press and you'll say A, B, or C. So, good question though. So, and that was how do you set the A, B, C ratios and literally I'll go through, I'll plug it out. We'll do the 430 first, um, which works like the 580s. And then I'll do the 600s, which will work the same way too. So, other things that you can get for the flashes, we do a, a battery pack. This is AA batteries. It's called the CPE4. Um, this. How, the question was, how many batteries can you hold in that? This system, this will hold six AA's, and then the flash will hold four AA's also. You can run them all at the same time, or you can say, okay, power off the pack first, and then once those the pack batteries are dead use the four and the um, flash. So you can kind of go through in the custom functions of the, of the flash, you can control and say, okay, how I want to run it. It is, there is an extension cord on it, you can wear it on your hip. There is a quarter 20 tripod screw on it, you can mount it to the bottom of the camera if you want to, however you want to do it. So. Can you get the lithium batteries as a one unit? Uh, we do not have a lithium battery option for here. Uh, we do have the ability to run, you can put lithium double A's in there, of course, if you wanted to, but it's only a double A pack. So there's not a rechargeable can and lithium pack for it. It's just this system runs double A's. Uh, you can use alkaline double A's. You can use rechargeable double A's, which are better for the environment. You just recharge them over and over again. Or you can use the lithium ones, uh, but they are one-time use. Question in the back, sir. Question was, do you get a shorter recycle time off the pack? A little bit, because there's just more power to the system. So your flash recycle time is faster, and then you can go for a longer period of time. It does not give you more distance, you know, it's not like putting a bigger flash on there, because you're, you're not changing the bulb out. You're just giving, you're just giving a long, longer lasting power to your camera. Like a cordless drill, you buy the bigger battery pack, that's kind of how we're looking at it. Okay. Question? Can you keep on at the same time, or you can Can you say the question one more time, I'm sorry? What's the difference between using all the batteries at the same time, versus the uh, in-camera and then you need the flash? The question was, you know, what's the difference between running all 10 batteries at once or running the six and then the four. Some people just want to have all the power at once. Some people just want to use the, the six and then if those die, I know I still have four more to go. It's just no, function. no functionality, it just changes. So it'll a little faster recycle if you're gonna run all six at the same time. Question? Um, I don't, the question was, do I use the quantum power packs? I don't. Um, the, I know quantum makes packs that you can plug into the flashes too. So um, there, I've heard of, you know, nothing against quantum. They're a great company. Um, you know, try it out and see what you get. So, any other question? Way in the back. Yeah, the question was, you know, be, uh, you know, do we have like a, a sheet or a number of how many pictures can we get on rechargeables versus alkalines versus lithium, and then what, at what power settings? Yeah, I mean, if you, if, I don't have, there isn't a number. You know, there's a lot of variations of temperature, humidity, um, what level of AA batteries. I mean, are you buying the, the, the brick of them from the, you know, convenience store for a dollar? You know, there's 75 batteries in there, or are you buying the name brand batteries um, from Duracell, Energizer, Railback, or any of the, you know, manufacturers out there. Um, rechargeable batteries. It kind of breaks down to the alkalines. Will give you a certain number. The double, the re, as long as you get a high enough milliamp, you know the highest milliamps that you can buy in the market now from companies like Delkin or any of the, the rechargeable AA battery companies out there, um, Duracell. Um, those will give you a little bit longer life because they have higher milliamps. And then the you know the one-time use lithium AA's will give you you know the most shots out of it. Is it double or triple shots? I don't have that number or anything like that. Um, firing the flash at full power, of course, you're going to use more power than if you dial the flash back down. So, question in the front row. Let's say the unit like this. I want to set up the camera on the on the, the bracket that I can't shoot. Uh, full screen of landscape. That means I need to use the uh, 64 attached to the camera. Is that going to work? 
question was, you know, if I want to connect a PC cord to the camera to the, the camera is going to be on, on a bracket. The, on the bracket. Mm -hmm. It is not connected to the camera. But then I want to use the PC controller if it can go uh, left or right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to work on the line. Question was a camera on a bracket, um, and then a PC, you know, cord going from from camera to flash, and then using this power pack. Also, yes, you can use it all in con conjunction. You can, since you're using a tripod screw on the on the camera, this um, battery pack does have a little Velcro case. You can Velcro it to your belt if you want to, or to the bracket itself. It will recognize the PC cord. Yeah, it'll recognize the PC cord or the or the or the uh, OCE3 ETTL cord. So. I have the PC cord here. I, the question was, I don't have a PC cord here. No. So, but the power pack is just plugging in this power pack port of the of the five series or the new six series flashes. That's, that's my, my main right. Did everything will work. So no problem. So, all right. So let's go through some flash, you know, situations here, and then what I'll do is we're gonna um, give you kind of a demonstration of how to set up the radio system or the infrared system. So, you know, fast shooting. The question, you know, it kind of goes back to the power packs. You know, rechargeable um, nickel metal hydrides will provide faster recycle times. The lithium batteries will will, require, will give you even longer uh, fast recycle times. Um, to avoid heat buildup, we recommend, you know, try not to shoot too fast. You just can't mash the shutter button down and shoot off. Um, after a few burst seconds, you know, give the flash a few moments to cool off. You know, the flash system, there is a temperature threshold where if they get too hot, they will go into protection mode so we don't burn the flash out. So just kind of be aware of, you know, that kind of situation. So, um, but, you know, we can, with flash photography, you know, you have a lot of control. Again, we're, you know, getting that light and we can move it around. We can point the light in different directions. You know, having, you know, some sort of, you know, hair light on the subject or having, you know, using some sort of soft boxes too to soften the light. There's a lot of things you can do with these flashes now versus, you know, just a kind of a direct flash light. You know, a lot of companies are making soft box dedicated only for putting speed lights into it. So you can do that either the infrared or the radio system to do. So we have a lot of control, you know, with the flashes on a bracket or having the flashes off camera, trying to get the light away from the camera. Um, because it can give you a lot of control of your system. Because we want to add light, we want to have control of that, we want to paint that light, and it's, it's just like photography. You know, we want to have that kind of situational control. Um, and if you can soften the light using some sort of diffuser or using some sort of larger soft box, and the, the closer you get that light to the subject, you know, the softer you can wrap that light around. So we're, you know, having that kind of quick control, having that kind of fun control with lights and speed lights um, to do that. So pop-up flash, um, five series or six series on the cameras, also a master flash system. If you want to do infrared, you can. We have the STE2 transmitter. You can do the STE3 if you want to do radio. Also, we have a lot of macro photographers that love using multiple flashes. Both our macro uh, lights, our MR um, MR14 and the MRT24, uh, which is a twin light, those are master flash systems. So if I want to do a macro light on the camera, like the one with the ring light, but I want to have maybe a little bit of backlight, I can set up a third flash off camera wirelessly and these both macro systems will trigger that. So we can set up flashes like this where we can have on camera flash and then we can you know backlight or highlight you know controls of, of different types of situations. So and you can shoot at extremely shallow depth of field, really fast shutter speeds and move that light around. So here again high speed sync works. You know high speed sync still works in the radio or infrared system. So you don't have to just be limited to that type of you know shooting situation. So you know again Having our you know um, camera macro type of system with a, with a third light off the camera situ off camera. So you know again distant subjects problem can happen you know when you're, when we're running out of light. Um, obviously you can use flash exposure compensation to kick up the light to have more power. Um, you know higher ISOs can give you more distance out of your flashes. Wider lens openings can give you more uh, possibilities. Try using, instead of the program mode, try using, because you're never going to shoot below a 60th of a second in program. So try using you know, shutter priority or aperture priority and you know, slowing the camera down a little bit to build up the ambient light. Um, if you're trying to get more distance downfield, you know, and you've got a soft box or some sort of you know, um, box or some diffuser on the flash, you know, those will cut light down because they're, they're softening the light, which is great for close up, but if you're trying to get light downfield, you can sometimes take those diffusing boxes off it. Situations for um, close-up photography with flash, you know, again, having our ability to shoot macro, small aperture lens openings, f16, f11, try to move the flash off camera, 
um, away from your, you know, right in front, right on on, ta on camera. Um, be aware of ambient light, you know, and then try out some of the macro flashes on there too, because you can get that light right onto the subject, um, and you can position that light and have power or control of both those little on camera flashes too. For action shots, fast shutter speeds, um, high speed sync is great. Uh, again, be aware that the high speed sync isn't going to send out light 30 feet or 40 feet downfield. The faster you shoot, the faster shutter speed you shoot the less power out of that light, or out of that speed light. So, you know, if you want some references, there's some really great ones. You know, Bob Davis has a great, um, who's one of our Canon Explorers of Light, uh, Lights, Camera, Capture. It's a great, he has basically, he has a, a full book. Also, he has an iPad version of it also. So, a couple of, you know, broke uh, systems that are out there. But, you know, the Hot Shoe Diaries, Joe McNally does use Nikon, but, you know, it's, it, all the, the terminology and the way that it uses flashes, it works out really, really well, too. So, um, some different op options out there also. We have our Canon Digital Learning Center, um, which is our free website for all, for all of you to use or anybody that wants to use it. There's no usernames or passwords. Um, I have friends in photography that use that type of website all over the world. So it is a great reference. What's and called? it's called the Canon Digital Learning Center. So you can go to, you can just go to your internet search and type it in if you want to. Um, otherwise, it's, it's learn.usa.canon.com. Um, or do an internet search of Canon Digital Learning Center. And go to our website, and there's different ways to find it there, too. So, But it is a great way for you to be able to go through and learn about the cameras and learn about the flashes. Um, you can We have tutorials on high-speed sync, using the radio flashes. Um, photographers like Tyler Stableford does a whole nice little tutorial on it. Bruce Dorn's done a bunch of work with it, too. So there's a lot of photographers on there that are showing you know, different applications for using multiple flashes in a situation. So I know Tyler uh, Stableford from Colorado did a nice uh, piece on the Digital Learning Center using multiple 600s uh, with the 1DX shooting at 12 frames a second and having the flashes keep up with them for doing some snowboard shooting. So some really cool applications and things that you can do for that. So, um, but, you know, flash pictures, you know, when there's no light, you can add light. So it's a nice thing about having your, you know, on-camera flash or using one of the external speed lights. Um, understanding how they work, how you can kind of control them too, is very, very important. You know, moving the light off camera so you can change the look of your shot. Whether or not you want to have direct flash, but you know, also remember, you know, sometimes turning the flash off can give you, uh, some, you know, a very pleasable scene also. So, you know, photography is a lot of fun. It's supposed to be a very fun hobby. Some people make money at it. I don't. I'm not a professional photographer. No one buys my photos, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I have more fun teaching than I do taking pictures. But. So, all right, I'm going to switch over here. I'm going to plug in the um, camera here, and I'm going to walk through um, the 600, and I'll walk through some menus here. I got you guys for about oh, uh, about a half hour here, so, so we'll go through and show you on the radio system what we do to go through the camera system. Um, I wanted to kind of cover in the first half a little bit of everything because not everybody owns 600s yet. But no, so we have the ability to you know show you and go through some of the camera options. So let me switch over with the cable here, and we will continue. You can see here up in the corner here now, we're in ETTL. Um, the 600 EXR, uh, EXRT has this automatic zoom head. It'll go from 24 millimeters wide all the way up to 200 millimeters. So that means the zoom head on the flash is like a mag light. Remember the old mag lights we used to twist from wide angle to a tight beam? That'll be set up on there. When you have it on the camera and you're zooming your lens, it'll automatically zoom for you. Uh, which is one of the nice features that the 600, the 430 does, and uh, on the smaller flashes like the 320 flash or the 270 EX2, they do have a zoom head, but it's manual. So when you zoom the head, you just got to pull it out or push it back in. So um, right now the flash is set to 35 millimeters. Flash is set to turn on. Here's our flash exposure compensation, custom functions and pro personal functions, and then our kind of menu system along the, the bottom here. So if I wanted to, let's say, just change my flash exposure compensation. You know, I can turn the rear dial here clockwise, plus or minus three exposure, back and forth. So I have that kind of control here also. When you press the set button first? On the six, the question was, do I have to set this, press the set button first? You can. Um, I have mine set up so I don't ever have to press the set button. I can just always turn this dial. It's, some people like to have the ability so you have to press a button so it doesn't accidentally go into it. I'm changing it. It's just quicker and easier just so I don't have to press the button. But both options are available. So that's just done through one of the custom functions. And then the custom functions here are 
And that's the one nice thing on the 600 now is the fact that it actually will tell you what the custom function is. On the 580s and the 430s, it just says, you know, custom function 6, 0, or 1. So I like that, that type of control. And the owner's manual will walk you through exactly what all these little icons will mean um, for it. Here's the flash exposure compensation. Do I want to press the set button and then turn the dial or just have the dial spin? And you said you're rotating the wheel? And I'm just rotating the wheel, yep. So we'll just, you know, I'm not going to go through every one of these. We, you know, we have tutorials on the website for what they all mean. So, um, sync speed, if I press it, we'll see that the high speed sync come up. So that up here in the corner now, so that's going to be the high speed sync, which means that when the flash is on the camera, I can shoot at any shutter speed I want. So, press it again, there's our second curtain sync, and then back to off. We have flash exposure bracketing. So if I want to bracket my pictures, I can do that. Say, okay, I want, you know, do three pictures, one at minus two flash exposure, one at zero, and then one at plus two. I can bracket my flash also if I want to. So, and we have that, you know, kind of fun controls and stuff we can do there. So, the power switch, <laughs> tilt my camera down a little bit. Power switch has off, lock, and on. If I switch that to lock feature, that bottom row of menu items disappear and all these buttons are locked out. And it will tell you that you're locked. If we go back to on, you have access to that. Also on the back of the flash, a little meter here because we're getting a really bright light here. There we go. Um, we have the mode button. And then we, on the left here, we have a little flash. And this is going to be the little sideways lightning button, which is going to be our wireless <coughs> options. And so then our wireless options, we can do, we'll cycle through the different options here. So mode button, we can go to manual if I want to. multi stroboscope scope if I want to. Oops. There we go. Somebody's paying attention. That's good. I like that. So mode button, we can cycle through the different options here from ETTL, manual if I want to, um, multi-stroboscopic. External A, external M, and then back to ETL. So if I press the flash button now, we're going to go into what we call the ability here so we can see our different types of um, radio systems. This icon up in the upper right hand corner stands for radio. And as I cycle through here, we go from radio master to radio slave, infrared master, infrared slave. Press it again, back to normal flash output. So just normal flash. So you'll see also the color will change the screen from green to amber. Whether you're in a slave mode or a master mode is a nice way to quickly check. You can swap those if you want. If you want you know, amber and green to be the other, you can do that. So let's talk about, oh, let's, let's do infrared master first. So infrared master. And then we have the ability now to say, OK, it says all, which means they're all going to fire at the same power. We can go in here now. This is my master flash on the camera. You'll see here we have a little flash icon with all the little lines coming out. That means this flash is part of the picture. And down here we have a button. It says, OK, I don't want this flash to be part of the picture. So now that little flash icon is gone. We have ratio. And I can do A to B, A, B, and C, or they're all at the same power. You know, we run them all at the same power. So you have that kind of control. When we're in. A, B option here now. Here we go. We can do that. You know, with the, we had the model there. We went 8 to 1, 4 to 1, 1 to 1, and then back the other way. So that's where you can control that from this flash. You could go into the menu system of the newer cameras now and, and do the same thing too if you wanted to. So now if we, switch, if we press this button now and we bring up infrared slave, here's our group option. So now we press group and group C, group A, group B. So if this is going to be, say, an A light, I can just sit here, leave this, and put this off on a camera stand or use a voice activated light stand and have somebody hold it and we can shoot all day long now and this is just A. I don't have to set anything else on here. I can change the zoom head a little bit if I want to. If I want the zoom head to be a little bit tighter or if I want to have a little bit wider um, uh, shot on it, I can do that also. So in the infrared system, we have channels 1, 2, 3, and 4. So you have multiple shooters at the same event, and you don't want to trigger your flash, each other's flashes. You can just divvy up who's channel one, channel two, channel three, and channel four. So that's what the channel group is on the infrared system. 
And he just says, as long as your, your master and your slaves are all your, on the same channel, you'll trip them. If you all want to share flashes, just set all your flashes to the same channel, and you're set to go. So back to group, group one, or um, infrared slave here. So let's go over to the radio option now. So now here's radio master. So again, the little radio icon, master, and then here's our, we're going to do an A-B ratio. This means our flash again is going to be part of the exposure. I can press the menu button here, and if I don't want the flash to be part of the picture, I can press the button. Flash it is now turned off or turned on. Ratio, same thing, A, B, all. I can set up all my different ratios if I want to that way. Now here's one thing with the radio thing. This is new with the infrared system. Again, it was just channels one through four. And if you all had your flashes set to one, then they're all going to set to the same channel. We have now a, a couple things we need to change. There is channel, and this works off of, there's one to 15 channels on the flash system. And you're like, well, which channel should I use? I can use the auto, which means it'll kind of pick and choose what it needs to use. One thing I like to do with the new system, and this is kind of neat, is the fact that I can scroll over here to the scan option and press scan. And the system will do a scan of the, all the frequencies in the area, and it'll represent in a graphical representation. Lots of things going on here, but what, which channel is the, has the highest frequency or the best option? And it says, okay, one, two, yeah, probably not so much. Three is pretty good, and it shows you here good is on towards the high. Actually, it looks like channel six is probably the highest. So instead of memorizing that, I can just scroll over here to channel six, hit the set button, and we're set to channel six. So now I'm going to get the best frequency out of that you know, channel. So instead of having the system just do auto, you know, and, and, and for those of us who remember cordless phones versus our cell phones, what you used to do, you know, if you picked up the neighbors a little bit, you press the scan button and did another scan and picked a different channel. So same. Uh, yeah, distance. The higher, the, the better the channels, then you're going to get a little bit more distance out of that. So, um, now, the other thing we have to do, you'll see up here in the, in the corner here, we're at, we're at a red link button. And what you need to do is, since this is going to be a master radio system, and we'll turn on another flash here real quick. And we'll set this one to slave. Since this is red here, we want to go in here and set a channel, or excuse me, an ID. And we need to set an ID. Now this number is whatever you want it to be. The default is 0000. zero, zero, zero. So if I want to set my ID to 1000, cycle so back, and then on my secondary flash, slide this one over here, and say, okay, on this one now we want to have the same thing where we want ID. 1000, and this one is set to slave. And when this flash goes on the camera now, I'll be able to get a, it'll give me a green uh, confirmation light. Once those, no, those ID numbers are set, we're good to go. Since this isn't on the camera right now, it's you know it's not going to do much anything on here. So once it goes on the camera, it will give me that uh, both lights will go green, and all your systems will be talking together. Once you've set your your ID on there, it'll memorize it. You don't have to do it every time. So. Yep, you just have to have the same ID on everything. So you have set set to you know minor set to one thousand. Everything has to be set to the same channel. If we do infrared radio slave, there we go. We're green. We're linked. And so you'll notice here on the back of these flashes and on this transmitter, everything is green. So we're ready to go and start shooting. So the ID is just a, a talking number. It's almost, I don't want to say IP address, just, just a number that you pick so all your flashes will have be on the same frequency. Security. It's, it's kind of a security frequency, but yeah, it's going to be so, you know, I have my flashes set to channel one. The default is 0000. zero, zero, zero. Like so, kind of a MAC address, I guess, if you want to call it. And that's it. So now from either the flash or, you know, we'll, so this is set to master, you know, so, but if I want to have control of my ratios or if I want to, you know, Swap my different options here. I can do that, and I can you know control my flashes. So if this was on, the, on, on my camera, since this is you know on a, on the table right now, you know, but you can you can imagine here this is being on the camera set to master, and we're ready to go. So one kind of cool thing is there there is I, uh, an option under the personal function. So if we do go to our menus here and go back to custom function, press and hold, and then you go to personal functions. You can adjust the brightness of the screen, 
Do I want master to be green or amber? You know, like I was telling you before. The other thing I like to do is the fact that there is the ability to go in here and say, there's a beep that you can turn on. And I think it's right. One of those things I don't memorize, but I know it's on here. There it is. Since I can't see these flashes, I can put them in soft boxes now. When they've recycled, I'll get an audio tone on my, um, my master flash saying, OK, all your flashes are recycled and we're ready to go. So instead of looking and seeing. Question in the back. Yep. You can turn it on so when you press the depth of field button, you can do a modeling light so they kind of give you that pulse to kind of see it. It's not a constant light, it's more of a stroboscopic, really high pulse. So, and we've been able to, it's almost like an autofocus assist light on, like, say, so the pop up flashes, or go bzzz, you know, so you can kind of see that. So, but all the custom functions and stuff are laid out on the, on the either the owner's manual actually does a really good job, or the um, website too, the Digital Learning Center. So, now you can memorize what you did. So you can set, set everything to memory if you want to. You can, you can press both buttons and clear everything you want to. If you want to reload that later, you can do that. So a lot of kind of simple controls. Once you play with it for a little bit, it's actually a pretty simple system to, um, to be able to operate and use. On the infrared system, slide you over. We'll go over this guy. This is a 430 EX2. And where's my stand? Almost like we've done this before. All right. There we go. Same kind of thing we've got on. Um, on, these, on these flashes, if you press and hold the zoom button, it'll take you to just normal shooting mode. Again, we have high speed sync, second current sync. We have modes from manual to ETTL. Custom functions, again, are set there. Down below, we have our set button and our arrow keys on off. If I want to do an infrared system, I'm going to use the pop-up flash on the camera. And press and hold zoom here and say, okay, what channel, you know, do I want this in channel one, two, three, or four? Or we just want to use one. And then I can press the zoom button here and then I had to tell it, say, okay, this is going to be an A flash, B flash, or a C flash. So again, it's kind of it's a little on the 430s and stuff, you just hold the button down and it'll bring you into either um, normal operation or slave option. And you'll see the little downward or sideways arrow here, which is the same on the 600. When in the infrared system, if your flashes are recycled and ready to go, you will notice a little flashing pulse on the, infra, on the AF uh, emitter. This will tell you that this flash is ready to fire. So I trigger them, and then when these batteries are good enough and everything's recycled, this little thing will start flashing at you again and tell you that you've been recycled and ready to fire again. On the 600, since it's radio and you can, you know, you can have the same thing set up, you can see here I have it set to this one where it's pulsing at you, um, you can have that feature turned on or off, or you can use the audio tone. So if it's in a soft box, you can't see the flash, you'll get that little beep or audio tone. So, and that's, and, and, you know, the transmitter, it looks just like the same as the back of a 600. So you can do that, and now I can trip the flash and they'll all fire. Now, a couple of the cool things you can do. Since these are transceivers, If we cycle through here now, and we just go back to normal shooting. So there's no radio master slave turned on or anything like that. I can press and hold the, radio, the remote button here, and it, oh, we turn in a feature called link shot, and it says slave. If I press link shot and go to master, OK, no problem. Now I can do this with the transmitter, or I can do this with another 600. Here's a little transmitter. Again, hold the button down, and we're going to do link shot master. And I want to make sure my channel is set to, I think we were at six, right? So channel six. So let's set this to slave. Oops. Come here. There we go, link shot slave. So this will be on the camera. Camera's turned on, everything's working. We're just gonna turn the live view off. Now, actually one last thing. On the 600, give it a second to come back here. There it is. Now we're on a link shot slave. 
Oops, but we're going to change that to master real quick. So the one on the camera is slave, this is master, and I get this little button down here in the corner that says release. If I press that, I can Hopefully, it all works well. Let's see what's going on here real quick. Oh, I know why. Steve, let me write, let me write your 5D. Or T4I or anything. And this leads me to my next point. All right, there we go. All right, link shot, master, slave, and trip, trip the camera. Work about 100 feet. I can trip it. Now, if I swap the two, Now I have to set this one to master, or excuse me, slave, because it's on the camera. Link shot, slave. Do the same thing. I can now trip the camera. I won't flash you guys. And fire all that way if I want to. Now, do you have a T4I up there? Everything maintains the same. If I had a 600 on here, everything's the same. Well, I could get light off here. I could turn the heads off if I want to. So the idea now is that maybe I could put this camera, hide in a bouquet of flowers, up on the altar, stuck a you know suction cup mount, you know fat gecko or one of them, and suck them to the back of a, of a backboard. And as I shoot, sorry, as I shoot, that camera shoots. So you can do that kind of work or. You can use like transceiver type works where you can just press the button on the, on the transmitter or on the flash and do that. Now, every cam that came out this year, no problem. The hot shoes have more information that we can send and trigger through the, the there's more data through the hot shoe. If you have one of the older cameras, like what we were just doing, and John looked kind of like an idiot because he couldn't get the camera to fire. Um, on the older cameras, like this 7D here, you can do the same thing we're doing. But since it's an older camera, you do have to have um, a secondary cable. And there's a cable on the side here. Let me go back to my live demonstration here. And that's just called link shot. You can actually trigger multi multiple cameras. You can do more than one if you want to. On the side of the flash, there is a port. This is also a side on the port of the STE3 transmitter. And this little port here, you can buy a cable and that will plug into the N3 socket of any camera. 5D Mark II, 50D, 40D, 30D, 20D, 1D, 7D, and that'll plug into the remote socket and you can do everything where it's doing. Um, so if you don't have one of the newer cameras that has the new intelligent hot shoe or you know more data hot shoe on it. So if you have a 5D Mark II or original 5D that you want to set up in a, as, a, as a remote camera, and we had a wedding shooter not too long ago I worked with, and he had we set one camera with a wide-angle lens, kind of hidden a bouquet of flowers up in the altar, put a large memory card in there, and he's like, you know, I'm just going to let that thing shoot. I'm only all I want is the first kiss. I've never had it from that angle before, with the with the audience or you know the congregation in the background. So we did, and he just shot, and you know, yeah, I was just taking pictures all the whole time. So, but it was kind of a cool setup, and he's like, you know, the, the, usually the reverend and the pastor won't let you like walk up behind him or next to him as he's given the ceremony, be like, yeah, I'm just going to take a few pictures, don't worry about me. So that's just kind of one thing that you can do there also. Um, on the bottom of the flash here, PC socket, oops, excuse me, PC socket, down here at the bottom. This is for a flash bracket. And then
the three pin there for the um, battery pack. So that's what those pockets are, there will be for also. Front of the flash, we still have drop down diffuser, bounce card if you want to. Otherwise, you can purchase any of the larger bounce cards too if you want to. Uh, if you don't want to use the meter, there is a built in uh, light meter here also too if you want to use the on camera flash meter versus the ETTL if you're going to be using full manual. You can use that as a, its own meter also. So and that's really kind of the setup and the you know layout of the SDE threes or the 600 EXRTs and how you kind of set them up for master radio flash system. So questions, comments, concerns on anything? Yes, sir. question was on link shot do I have to have all the systems on, on the same well if you have if you want to have multiple cameras shooting you know three or four remotes yeah that's you, they just all have to be set to link shot master or slave and you can shoot you could just leave a camera as a you know remote and then just instead of having link shot turned on if this is on the camera I can say okay I'm just going to be doing you know my normal flashes I don't want to trigger that camera yet and then I can go in and engage link shot if I want to so as the transceiver system works Good question, though. Question way in the back. Good question. Uh, what kind of um, data is the metadata adding? You'll, you'll get flash number, you know, what flash model was on the camera. You'll get the zoom head, the zoom of the lens and stuff, um, and then flash exposure compensation. So, you know, if they had it plus, set to plus one or minus two or something like that. So, yes, sir. There are no basic questions. So the question was, when do you use the zoom feature here? Or how do I use it? The zoom feature, so if I press, you know, if this is on the camera, they have an automatic zoom head. So when I zoom the lens, it'll zoom for me. I can change it if I want to, you know, from wide all the way up to, on this flash, goes up to 200 millimeters. It's really set for, do you, like, you know, like I was kind of going back to the um, mag light, where you twisted the front of the mag light, so from a wide beam to a narrow beam. You know, do you want a wide coverage or a really tight coverage? You know, and then if I pull out the diffuser, you'll see we drop down to 14 millimeters, which is going to be a you know wide angle, basically for what lens you have on the camera. So it matches whatever lens. So the normal range will be about 24 to 200. So if you have your 70 200 millimeter lens on there, or 24 to 105, or a 50 prime, you know the, the, this will just match the, your angle of view that you see. When you zoom a lens. You'll, the, the head will zoom automatically with you back and forth, automatically. So if I have a you know a 24, 18 to 135, or you know whatever lens I have, as I zoom, when I press the shutter down halfway, you'll you'll hear in, you know, the the head on the flash move also, and it's adjusting your basically beam or coverage, just like your lens is adjusting that coverage also. Question. They take that same setup, they'll use it with a gel and use it to light a background. For right. There, yeah. And the other the question was, you can also put a gel on there, and I can tight, real tight beam or real wide beam. Right. And if I want to change the color of a white wall to red, put a red gel on it, and all of a sudden that white be that wall becomes red, or a purple gel, or a blue gel, or whatever I want to do. So, question. It still works with the ETTL mode, but if you have the across the manual, would the system still work? Yeah, I can set the manual zoom, and I can either have it on the camera to manually zoom, or set a zoom to it. So, either way, manual here, a manual in the flash is just going to be ex manual ex power output. So instead of ETTL now, I can say, okay, you know, what's my power output of the flash? You know, do I want one twenty-eighth of a power all the way up to just normal one-to-one -one full power? And then it will stay there. It won't fluctuate. ETTL is going to just like, you know, any type of automatic exposure, it, it can fluctuate a little bit. So. But the zoom can change or you have to switch back? You can set either way. The zoom I can set to manual or automatic if I want to. If it says A, we're in auto zoom. If it says M, I'm in manual zoom and it won't change. So in the zoom head, is just going to be correlation to what lens you have on the camera and as you zoom it, this head will compensate for you. And that's true on the 430s, the 580s, the 600s. On the littler flashes, like the 320 flash, um, sorry to step out of the camera range here, but on the 320 flash, you know, we still have angle. I can trip it up and down if I want to. Um, my controls are all in the back here, so if I want to have any type of controls, but if I want to zoom the head, so this is wide angle, that's telephoto. So this is going to be just like twisting the light. So you're just going to pop it in and out. Still has bounce and swivel controls. So one neat thing that the um, 
320 has. Since I have it in my hand, I can just you know talk real quick about it. The 320 does have the ability to um, have a manual LED light for video. So if you want to do a little video light, it's good for interviews and stuff. It's not going to light up a whole room, but good for about five, six feet. So if you want to have a little video light, nice little flashlight for your camera bag too, built in. Um, and the other neat thing on the 320, and then not a lot of not a lot of people know this, but both the 320 and the 270 speed light has a secondary button on the side of the flash, and that is an RC6 infrared remote. So I can now trigger the camera for my flash. So if I want to have my camera pop up flash, infrared remote set. We go into menu, down to flash control, built in flash settings, go down to wireless, until I've done this a few times. Flash control here, where this is not going to be part of the exposure, I just want to trip my secondary flash. You can see there's all my groups if I want to change something. I grab my flash, make sure it's all set to A, B, slave, no problem. What I can do now, and this will flash and tell you that it's you know ready to fire. One one thousand, two one thousand, three. So there's an infrared remote built into it. So I can now, if I have multiple flashes set up, but maybe you know, or you know, you're taking a picture of your kids, and you're like, well, John, I haven't bought in twelve flashes yet. I just have one, you know, and I don't have light stands, and I just want to be my voice activated light stand. You can, you know, it's a two second timer, so you don't have a picture of yourself doing this. So there is a timer, so you can reposition the flashes and stuff. So Trip the cameras, and then infrared. You can see I'm not pointing the system right at the camera. It's bouncing off the walls a little bit. So that's one thing the 270 and the 320 flash has that kind of capability. So a little built in infrared. Question? On the, on the yep, the 600. On the 600, you can if you don't want to use the ETTL metering system. All kinds of stuff going on here. So I can go into external A or external M, and then I basically I'm going to, you know, put into my settings of the camera, but I'm not going to use the through the lens metering system at all. I'm going to use the external flash metering. And it's just that, so if I'm having the camera off connected off camera through a PC cord or something like that, I can use the metering system just for that one flash. So most of the time it's the the TTL system. So which would be normal ETTL. So, now the question was, you know, and that's a good question, should I, is it okay to leave the batteries in the flashes and stuff and, you know, for a day or so? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, if you left them in the flash like in a really humid area for two years, chance that the alkaline batteries could leak, you know, but, I mean, just for a couple, I mean, for months, or you know, you're, you're fine. I mean, it's not, you don't have to pull the batteries out every time you're done using the system, so. No, if it is, does it drain power? No, you can just you turn the flash off. It's not gonna. There's no residual pull on that. So, question. Can the camera batteries drive just the electronics? The question was, can the camera batteries just drive the head for programming? No, you have to have batteries in the flash system or even in the transmitter. Uh, the new transmitter runs on two AA batteries. The old transmitter ran on a CR5 battery, I believe it is. So a little harder to find, but you can run them so. If you have any other questions for me, I want to thank everybody for coming today to the B&H event space. So, thank you very much. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web 